Free frog, I gotta take a piss. You got it, bro. Beer joints much like another, you know. Speaking of beer, I still got a powerful thirst. Hey, long as you got tree frog. Animal, you are so predictable. I'm Peyton Quinn, Mark Animal McYoung, Mike the Amazing Eagle Hainick. We sure hope that you uh, enjoyed watching that barroom brawl fantasy as much as we did uh, creating it for you. But it was truly a fantasy. And our primary objective here is to communicate to you the difference between the Hollywood TV fantasy of fighting and the reality of fighting 
in bars and saloons as we have experienced it firsthand in our work as bouncers and coolers and a number of different bars for we uh, learned a better way to make a living. There's two things I want to get off right away. Number one, fighting is no game. It has serious legal and medical consequences. When, quote, adults fight, it often goes well beyond uh, fat lip or a uh, black eye. Fighting among adults can mean paralyzed spines as well as missing teeth or broken arms and legs, losses of vision, brain damage, paralysis, as well as lengthy prison sentences. There's none of us here who would disagree with the statement that fighting is really a no-win proposition. Number two, let's look at this idea of self-defense itself. What is self-defense? What does it mean? When most people think of self-defense or a program of self-defense, they think of a course in judo, karate, western boxing, etc. Here the emphasis is on technique, physical technique. But in reality, you need to expand your concept of what self-defense really means. Your first self-defense strategy is avoidance. Avoidance works by being aware. A fight avoided is a fight won. So we're going to look at this first. We're going to look at this expanded idea of self-defense in awareness and avoidance. Mark, Animal, look out. You know, like in Star Trek, how they do uh, briefings before they beam down onto the planet, right? Tell so people don't make mistakes like social uh, gaffes. Well, this is sort of a debriefing on how to operate on this planet Earth. You know, the bars and the dives, the places I know. You mean animals world? Let's test these guys. Let's take a look at the attack of Stephen the Heathen on my precious body. You asshole! First off, in our collective experience, not all ambushers will give their intended victim this kind of vocal warning before the blow. However, many do, which is a definite point on your side. So let's consider why they do this. Knowledge of how somebody will attack is a definite benefit on your self-defense tactics and survival. One of the reasons somebody might come at you like this is, in a sense, it's like a half-assed war cry. What they're trying to do is foster their own courage as they attack you. Make no mistake, well, the ambusher isn't real courageous, and even though he may have to wolf a little to get his dick pumped up to attack, the bottom line is he wouldn't attack until he's pretty confident that you are a safe victim. The ambusher is an individual who is the equivalent of a middle line predator. He is not only the hunter, but he is the hunted. He has to be very careful as to who he attacks, because if he attacks somebody who can fight back too well, he will become the victim. A bit later, we're going to look at things that you can do to show the would-be ambusher that you are not a safe victim. But first, let's go back to see why some ambushers will shout out before they attack. The second reason for shouting is that it acts as a setup to allow the ambusher to close the distance between himself and his would-be victim. A shout, or a loud noise, will sometimes paralyze a person or stun them for a moment. One, screaming, die! No matter what, no matter how much training you've had, a sudden shout and scream makes persons tense their muscles. Face it, a frozen stationary target is always easier to hit. Finally, even a loud, hostile voice is still verbal communication. 
we have seen a lot of people get taken out because they were not ready for a verbal assault to immediately go into a physical assault without warning. The point is, is don't just stand there when someone is shouting at you and closing the distance. Get out of the way. It sounds so obvious, and it is. It fucking amazes me why so few people do it. Next, let's consider the more adept, at least semi-pro, ambusher. This is more how he operates. Notice he didn't say anything. He just closed quickly and uncorked his shot from my blind side. The ugly truth is, it's pretty hard to handle this type of ambush once it's gotten to this point. So let's back things up a bit and see how I got into this mess in the first place. Hi. It seems like the majority of all fights either start over women or over money. I say seems like because whether it's over women or money or something else, it's almost always really about ego. It's really unfortunate that a number of the weak-egoed would-be ambushers consider women to be personal property. Even a glance at their woman can be considered infringing on their territory. Don't even think of approaching a woman until you've thoroughly scoped out the situation. Be aware, she may have a real boyfriend or husband. A gorilla in the mists, if you will. is fresh meat for a punch-out party. Be aware of your surroundings. Choose a place where you can't be attacked from every possible direction. By choosing a strategic site to sit, you can limit the approaches that somebody can come at you from. The classic example of this is the guy who sits in a corner with his back to the wall. One of the most fundamental concepts that you need to know to avoid trouble in these kind of places is that of personal physical space. In the animal kingdom, this is called territory. When another animal of the same species enters one animal's territory, there is going to be conflict. It's the same in the human world. An insensitivity or an ignorance of personal space is the, at the root of a number of fights and altercation. One of the big fantasies people have about fights is the toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Actually, tournament karate and boxing matches foster this idea as much as TV and movies. Real fight among adults rarely work like this. There's seldom any stand-up, back-and-forth action. Most times, once one guy lands a blow, he continues to pound the guy till it goes to a grapple or his victim is knocked down. It's important to remember that when somebody's interviewing you for a punch-out potential, one of the things that he's looking for is fear. This is why you cannot show fear when somebody is in your face. Now, don't make the other mistake of jackrabbiting into macho mode. The best way to handle it is to appear calm. Now, internally, you may be about to wet your pants, but it cannot show on your face. Even in the most stylized of martial arts techniques, there exists the essence of a fundamental combat concept. There are only a few of these concepts which express themselves in a wide variety of individual techniques across a number of different martial arts styles and fighting systems. Indeed, 
Martial arts styles themselves can be meaningfully differentiated on the basis of which one of these fundamental concepts is emphasized. In Aikido, the concepts of circular movement, evasion, blending, and leading the assailant's aggressive energy are emphasized. In karate styles, great emphasis is placed on achieving straight line, powerful strikes. In judo, it's the idea of unbalancing and body leverage to achieve powerful throws. Some modern forms of self-defense training have abandoned the traditional notion of a lifetime of study and endeavor to give the uh, student the most pragmatic and applied skills in these concepts in the minimum time. Any and all of these approaches in any combination can be made to work depending on your own determination and spirit. The important thing is to practice with dedication and sincerity. In formal training, the dojo is like a laboratory where you can isolate the essential principles and concepts in a fighting technique and safely explore its limits and potentials. This is why mastery of concept and principle is far more important than simply amassing a collection of techniques. Just as the simple eight notes of a musical scale can be combined and interpreted to produce virtually all the music in the world, a handful of conceptually simple movements adapted from the natural movements of everyday life become the physical principles at the core of all martial arts and fighting methods. Now let's take a look at one simple idea from one art and see how it starts as a principle, a physical movement, becomes a martial art technique, and finally, a technique for real fighting. This combat movement is no more than ordinary pushing and pulling. Pull and push. Pull and push. Push and pull. One critical concept you need to understand to make this pulling movement work is that you drop your hips before affecting the pull. The other critical idea is to first take the slack out of the arms. Pay attention to Mike's instruction. Thank you, Mike. We've tied a, a belt, a regular martial arts training belt, like you would wear, to this big heavy bag. One of the big, one of the important principles here is taking the slack. When you begin to use this in a combat mode, you're going to have to take the slack out of your opponent, or he's just not going to move. Imagine this is the arms of the opponent. Well, if I put a bend in here, and I want to move this bag, by yet on the bell. And what happens? Nothing. Because of the slack. It doesn't transfer any in, in the energy to the bag. So what I need to do is take the slack out of the strings, and I need to take the slack out of my own body. It won't help if I'm loose and slack. I need to drop my hips back, straighten my arms, and to me. Observe this woman's application of the principle. Push, push, and pull. Let's take a look at how I applied this combat concept of pushing and pulling Funukogiando to our fantasy bar fight. Okay, uh, you remember back to the our fantasy fight. I'll love it when I'm scheduled to win them. Uh, my first man, my first attacker, came at me and I was between two obstructions. I had a wall to one side and I had a pool table to the other side. Well, this pretty well limited my tactical opportunities. I may have stepped back, but that wouldn't have been such a good idea, I don't think. 
So I opted instead to use his momentum, my momentum, and when he swung his punch, and he's just like straight slow, I went inside of his strike, which frees me from the danger of that. I bring my own body up close to his, which gives me the room to extend my first technique. Now at this point, that man was so large, I didn't see many opportunities to be able to damage him with hand strikes. He was just too big a guy to soak up that kind of punishment. So I opted to use my environment and just pull him down into the table. Remember the other guy was scheduled to beat up. He was going after Mark, the animal. So he went and reached for his knife, and he's focusing completely on his target, which was Mark's back. Well, this gave me the opportunity to come in from his blind side. Would have been stupid for me to try and reach for his weapon or try and tangle with him there. Bang! Now I'm... Bad idea. Bad idea. So I opt instead to go back behind him and let his momentum carrying forward pull his legs out from under him, kind of like shaking the sand out of a beach blanket. Fix it again. Okay, of course you remember the guy who ate animal's bottle defense, who came around and uh, had his broken knee and everything like that. Well, why waste a good busted leg? <laughs> I'm that kind of guy, I guess. So in, in that technique, for safety and training, we might, this is called a sweep, and for safety and training, we might go more towards the meaty section or behind his knee. This is an easier strike for him to take. In reality, we want to hook the ankle out. That destabilizes him in a way that a lot makes his head hit the ground first. And that was this one. <laughs> this technique of capturing a sword Tachi Dori teaches a concept of how to disarm an enemy of a weapon, a sword, perhaps even a shotgun. Finally, we again look at teaming up this fundamental push-pull movement with environmental obstructions. In this case, another truck. Keep this consciousness of identifying the concepts in movements as you study Peyton's instruction. We are going to examine my barroom brawl defense within the context of these primary combat concepts. The particular techniques I use are really simply physical expressions of these concepts. One, relaxation. Two, not contesting power. Three, economy of movement. Four, continuous attack. And five, attacking on the enemy's preparation to attack. I have entered into the enemy. Next, with the pool cue attack, note that I first step off the attack line. Note my left hand is chambered for the blow to the head. This is not contesting power. An economy of movement. Now we see continuous attack as I use the pool cue, which sets up the throw. All this is made possible by relaxation and flowing and blending with the attack. Not contesting power means stepping off the attack line 
In order to step off the attack line, we first need to identify the angle of attack. Note that the attack line itself is the same here, whether it's a fist or a fist holding a knife. You must condition yourself to immediately perceive and step off the attack line. Notice how this is done. Pay particular attention to footwork. Here, we're shifting to the inside. Notice the body rotation. We mentioned that a verbal assault or verbal challenge or berating or what we call woofing can go immediately to the actual attack. Well, here's what that looks like, for example. You piece of shit, I'll fucking kick your ass. I'll kick your ass. Bam! Now, here's another, here's another mistake people make. You be the woofer, come in on me. Woofing, pushing, kick your ass. I, I, uh, okay, now look. Look what's happening. He's driving me back along the same line, okay? The other central mistake is moving back from your, hey, 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 uh, along the same line as he's moving in on you. This is really the same mistake as failing to step off the attack line. The best thing to do, of course, is just this. When he comes in, hey, I don't think so, buddy, and be gone. Notice when he reaches the hand out, I'm controlling it by this elbow here, okay? That's how I'm brushing past. Let's take a look at that again. <laughs> I don't think so, buddy. Now I'm moving past. To summarize this, keep in mind that selling noise, I'm going to kick your ass, you piece of shit, man, can be a prelude to close distance to come in close enough for the strike. Don't allow people to come in that uh, close. Don't allow them to sell shit verbally and then get that close to you. As soon as that happens, move off to the corner. The brush hold strike movement was used in my pool cue defense in our bar fight. Note how I brushed the weapon arm past with my right hand and momentarily held it, which opened the path for the strike to my attacker's head with my left hand brush, hold, strike. You are more likely to be attacked with a punch than with a pull cue. So let's see how the brush, hold, strike movement is employed against the punch. Now, we're going to look at a movement called brush, hold, strike. He throws the hook. I'm moving in. My Taisabaki movement, my body shift, is moving my head out of the perfect focus of the blow. Failing to do this, means you're not going to get any further with your defense because here's what's going to happen. Boom! All right? So body shift is the key. If you haven't got proper body shift, perceive the angle of attack, hook, and moved in, then you're not going to get any further. Let's take a look at brush, hold, strike. Brush, hold, strike. Let's look at it real slow. Throw the punch very slowly. As I come in, I throw this hand up for protection. Not contesting the power of the blow, but continuing it along its arc. Brush, hold, strike. Brush, hold, strike. Throw it a little bit of speed. attack, okay? We used a rather flamboyant breakfall, but the principles are the same. I would not use that flamboyant breakfall in a real fight. Real fights are too serious. We did that for your uh, visual entertainment. The attack was number 12, or straight up and down, straight up and down. I will not defend attack. A potentially deadly attack with a weapon. Let me also mention that this angle of attack straight down like that is used almost exclusively when the person does have a weapon. Not people, people are going to attack you with an empty hand 
straight down like that. A machete, a stick, a sword. Okay. That's when you get this angle. Pool cue. The weapon is really dangerous right here. Right there. Oof. That's where it's going to get me. It's not so dangerous in here. Okay? Here's where it was dangerous. Inside, it's not so dangerous. On this type of attack, straight up and down, there's really only, you only got two choices. Okay? In terms of you identify the attack line, okay, and you step off the attack line. Here's how we step off the attack line. It's here, okay, or it's here. Inside and outside. Notice again, I'm not contesting it. I'm allowing it to traverse its arc. So we keep a loose open hand. We use Tysabaki motion. And we move in with it. Brush hold strike could be used here. Okay, no problem. For example, he swings. Wham! Now, if I tried to bring his stick up forcefully, I would be contesting his power. You see, I'd never get it. I might, you know, if I was a big, strong guy, and I went whack here and whack here, I might. But we don't want to contest the opponent's power. So instead of going directly to this, I step further off the attack line, bam, screw up his skull and brains a little bit more. Now, at this point, his mind has gotten around to trying to pull this, retrieve his weapon. When he does that, retrieve the weapon, now I can whack him with it because I'm using his own force. Now his muscles are working with me. The pull cue is heavy and lengthy, which extends my attacker's recovery time. Therefore, I step further past him and strike him with my free hand to his head before hitting him with the stick. Let's contrast this situation with the beer bottle attack on animal. Animal's attacker used a beer bottle, which is lighter, and its recovery time is much less. It can be moved more quickly. Therefore, Animal was able to go directly to the beer bottle, to the face technique. By the way, this is a Hollywood bottle. This is a real bottle. Real bottles don't break too easy. The best time to attack is on your enemy's preparation to attack. This is really the essence of timing. Also, I want to point out, if you know somebody's just about to launch their attack, why give them a chance to launch it? Especially if you've got multiple opponents, you must take the fight to the, to the enemy. The first man, I see the guy with the pool cue, he's about to come in. The second guy's about to come in too from two different directions. I'm not going to wait for them to attack. I have to take the attack to them now. Okay. The other guy comes in with a hook. All right. Okay. Let's look at it slowly. It really relies on timing. Very slowly. I see the attack coming. I see the attack and I enter. This is his, on his preparation to attack. Very slowly. I see that he's about to attack. I move in. This is attacking on his preparation to attack. Now notice what I've gotten here. Let's do it very slowly. It's a hook. I'm turning. So I don't get the hook, and I'm turning him with me. And then I'm dropping the elbow, I'm dropping my elbow, and I'm dropping his face at the same time. When we worked as bouncers and coolers, we were paid to handle the situation. We couldn't just walk away from the confrontation because we were being paid to handle it. You're not being paid you can walk away, and I suggest you do so. There are two reasons people don't walk away, which is their absolute best survival strategy. One, because they're just so unaware. They don't see that a fight is coming on. They don't recognize the interview. They don't see that a verbal confrontation can go directly in by design 
to an actual attack. They don't see the cues that precede the fight. The second reason people don't uh, simply walk away from the potential fight, don't walk away from the conflict after they've seen it and recognized it, is because they're locked into a machismo mindset. They're afraid of what people will think. They're afraid people will think they're backing down. They're afraid they uh, will be acting uh, like less than a man because they're letting someone else define what a man is to them. They're not truly in control of themselves because someone else is. When you're in control of yourself, it's really easy to make these decisions. There's nothing in it. Fight is a knowing proposition. You only do it when there's absolutely no way out. The guy's on you. He's trying to stick it in you. He's, okay? And if you keep it like that, there's another advantage. Once you are fighting, you're of complete mind. You're not divided mind. Okay. Because you know in your whole being you wouldn't be doing this except there was no other way. So there's no divided mind also allows, curiously, a certain amount of relaxation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Don't accept uh, the invitation to a fight, and I want you to think about that. That's uh, always a strategic and tactical error in that it allows the enemy to decide the time and the place for the confrontation. Absolutely. And uh, always, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a harder to fight your way out of a mistake, that's for sure. Don't make that mistake. There you mm -hmm. go. You know, when I was in Venice growing up, I was a young buck, and we did all this, these mistakes. And you know, there were 10 of us, and we were good. And now there's only two of us, and that's 15 years later. So that should act as a really serious reminder as to how serious this stuff can be. What's the point of self-defense? The point of self-defense is survive. The point of self-defense is to be allowed to live. Well, I'm not going to get so deep as what's the point of living. <laughs> it's up to you. But I can tell you, pal, the point of living is not senseless fighting among ourselves. Uh, there's, it's a no-win proposition. Uh, there's a lot more fun things and productive things to do with your life. Like blondes. That too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. And that wraps it up. All right. These books by Mark Animal McYoung are available from Paladin. Peyton's book, A Bouncer's Guide to Barroom Brawling, is also available from Paladin Press.